Hello, everyone. Welcome to Cataloging Cocktails, where we bring ideas and conversations about data and data management, uh, as well as our favorite beverages. Um, you got Tim Gasper here, uh, Director of Product over at Data.World, uh, joined also by Juan, our Principal Scientist. And we uh, hey, also have a, a special guest today, um, uh, Ernie, welcome. Thank you, thank you, Tim, thank you, Juan. Pleasure to be here. Yeah, yeah so how's, have you here. how's your day going? What are you guys drinking then? What's your poison today? Today I'm drinking a uh, bourbon uh, called Few, F-E-W, if I remember correctly, it's from Illinois. A uh, little bit spicy, not quite as spicy as a rye might be, but, uh, but the sweetness cuts it just enough, but it's nice. Awesome. How about you, how about you Tim? sounds delicious. I have a, uh, a Paloma going on. My, uh, my wife has found out that I like uh, uh, alcohol and cocktails. And now anytime we hit like important milestones or, or birthdays or whatever, I get something alcohol related. And so she got me this, uh, this good mixer. So I'll actually take the link, uh, the, the, the link into the, the chat in case anybody's interested. It's a pretty good, uh, pretty good cordial mixer. Um, what about you? What are you drinking, Juan? So I, I, I'm, I did something with cucumbers. So vodka, basically a vodka tonic and cucumber. I was doing, uh, making tzatziki the other day and I had to, you had to go squeeze that, that uh, squeeze all the cucumber and get all that water out of the cucumber. And, and I'm like, well, I got to do something with it. And I did it over the weekend. Like, this is pretty good. So nice, refreshing summer drink. So um, we have uh, all it's can Canada Day too. So I'm sure hopefully there's some people from Canada who are drinking some Canadian whiskey, right, John? <laughs> yeah, I heard, John, you might have something to, to share that you're drinking. Do you have any updates on the Canadian front? I'll actually, uh, I'll interject here. Uh, hi, everybody. Welcome to Catalog and Cocktails. Uh, my name is John. I'm the Chief Product Officer and Co-Founder at Data.World. I really appreciate everybody's attendance. It's great to unwind at the end of the day and, and hear folks like Ernie, who's just been an incredible partner uh, to us, uh, and, you know, wax on data management issues with Tim and Juan and unwind. And today is Canada Day. It's the birth of our nation. I am Canadian. I moved to Austin 20 years ago, but I am drinking some Crown Royal today. Ernie, you're drinking a, 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 a bourbon from Illinois. Eh, it's close <laughs> enough. You know, upper Midwest, it counts. It's like Toronto. <laughs> <laughs> uh, All right. But thank oh, you for joining us today, Ernie. Thank you, everybody, who's been attending this week over week. All right. Uh, well, and I'll let Juan and Tim have at it because these two are hellishly entertaining. Uh, they entertain me every day. I get to work with them. So, well, thanks, John. So, um, well, please chat, uh, comment in the chat. Who's here? Where are you from? Uh, how did you find out about us? Uh, and and what are you drinking? And I think today, like we've had this, we've had all these different topics, right, all around data and stuff. And over the last couple couple of sessions, last one we talked about knowledge graphs, and before that we talked about kind of the data personas and and features that a data catalog should have so different consumers and producers of data can be successful at their job. And one of those topics that came up, well, the features is data lineage. And, and I think that was like, we were talking like, this is a discussion that we should really have with the broader, the broader folks and like who better with, with Ernie, one of our really good partners here. Um, so I, I just kind of want to just kick off the discussion on, on what is data lineage? Because this is something that we hear all the time and it's like a checkbox that somebody hears somebody somebody like somebody is being told you got to go ask if this company does data lineage and they say do you do data lineage and they're like yes or no and they like check it off the box right but people don't really know what data lineage is and what it's for and i think hopefully that's like this discussion that we're going to have so uh, i mean ernie what did, in a in a nutshell what is data lineage yeah, that's a that's a really great question, and uh, you know, having been sort of consumed and passionate about data lineage for the last oh goodness twenty years, but really absorbed into it for the last ten or so, um, when we speak of data lineage, uh, we're typically talking about understanding more about where your data comes from and where it's going to. 
And it's interesting because there are subsets of data lineage, but we usually when we're talking about data lineage at that generic level, we're talking about what is the source of the tables and the columns that we're looking at in this report, the query items, if you want to call them that. I'm looking at an Excel spreadsheet and I've got one bar on that spreadsheet representing profitability. Where did profitability come from, right? How was it generated? How was it aggregated? When, when was it aggregated? And when we talk about where does it go to, where does it come from, helps us identify the different use cases that customers are looking for when they're trying to solve lineage cases. Yeah, so, so I think if, if we think about, again, the data management world, one thing is I'm going to go catalog the data and, and I want to go access the data, go query it. But the other aspect too is I want to understand how this data is related to other pieces of data, to other pieces of metadata, to, to the actual people who are consuming it. And I think that's, I think that's the key aspect here that we need to really understand that it's not just about the data by itself, it's how the data is related. So the relationships are key. And I think that's where the data lineage comes in, comes into the play. Understanding what is, what is the relationship and, and connecting to the topic from last week is that's why you want to have things as a knowledge graph, right? You want to be able to connect sure. the, yeah. the relationships. Yeah, I was actually going to say that last week we talked kind of about knowledge graphs and why, why it's so valuable to have your catalog built on a framework that allows you to have relationships be sort of a first class citizen. Uh, and obviously lineage is a very special kind of relationship, right? Because it's not uh, just about, you know, that these two things are related, you know, and obviously there are, there are nuances of sort of that kind of relationship, like, oh, these are related or contained within or synonyms of and things like that, right? Uh, but specifically, you know, in lineage, there's sort of a, uh, it's sort of a directional uh, relationship, right? Where there are things that are more upstream and there's things that are more downstream, uh, and there are things happening along the way, things like uh, transformations, things like mappings, things like, uh, you know, um, filtering and things like that, right? And so that, that data is, is, it's almost more like a river or like a, something like that, right? So, so yeah, what, are, okay. what are these relate? So what are these relationships? So we're, we're saying that data needs to be not just data by itself, but how data is related. But what are actually these relationships? Well, I was just going to say that the, the, the where our two solutions complement each other is in those particular entry points, because I'm going to come into lineage, but I might not start there. You know, I start because I need to understand, well, I don't know, how does the company define profitability? And then by going, you know, into the catalog to understand those definitions, and I see that, uh, oh, wow, you know, Tim is our steward for that, so I can reach out to Tim, and oh, boy, it points to this particular Excel spreadsheet. That's the entry point, which then leads to the relationships of lineage. So as you're, you're right, it's a myriad of relationships all tied together. Lineage, of course, being a flow uh, of how that data actually runs through your data pipeline. So like I, I've seen part of the lineage in, in, in things. So I, I, I don't know, I, I see it kind of in two sides. There can be some sort of, let's call it simple lineage or simple relationships where more like complex uh, lineage, which I would consider more like as, as transformation. So sometimes it's like, hey, this column here got moved into this column in this table here, right? And, and then they got renamed. So the, the, the F name got translated into first name, right? That's something very simple you want to go do. But then other types of lineage that you see are th th this like profitability, right? So somebody has a, a, a up consuming data that has a column called profitability, but I, I swear that there was no data in the source called profitability, right? There is some transformation going on. And uh, so that's how I would see it. Like there's a simple one-to-one -one and then there's, there's these complex transformations. It, I mean, in your experience, Ernie and, and, and Tim, like how, how, do you, how, how have you guys seen the world there? Well, I think it helps to look at the, the particular use cases, right? Why is someone interested in lineage? And when you take that profitability example, it might be as simple as uh, a trust factor. You know, someone just needs to know that it came from a particular data lake or data warehouse that they've been briefed on, and that's going to be enough for them. Or maybe once they get to that source, they can see, well, when was it refreshed? Oh, I can call Juan and I can see when it was refreshed, or I can see the date right there in the lineage, and great, it was refreshed last Monday. I'm comfortable with it. But it also leads to those compliance cases, right? I might have to demonstrate how profitability was calculated 
there is no column called profitability. So what factors went into it? I need to actually show that calculation to the regulator um, or government uh, person, or, or I might risk a fine or, um, you know, at least want to keep them off our trail and, and, you know, make sure that they're confident in what we're doing. Yeah, see, see. it seems like depending on the use case, um, you know, different levels of detail are required. I, I know one of the concepts that we have uh, that we talk about sometimes is like high level lineage where, you know, you're just like, oh, yeah, this came from, um, you know, this came from that database, right? Okay, cool. That's the information that I needed uh, versus much more detailed lineage where, you know, um, Juan, you talked about, you know, like, for example, uh, you know, SQL transformations or calculations and things like that. You know, Ernie, you're talking about how, um, you know, you may need to sort of do some further investigation and things like that. And, uh, you know, and, and, you know, there's a lot of factors that can go into those different transformations, right? So who, who are the personas? So if we connect to other conversations we had, right? So we have this, this feature called data lineage and stuff, but so what are the, what type of people would be using lineage for what? To go solve what problem? So absolutely, like we've started to talk about, the trust in, in and understanding one is a is a key goal and that persona oh it might not be the c-level executive team but it could very well be the, the the group that supports them right so there's a concern about that report and where does it come from and so there's a team that's going to research it and there are you know war stories about people that need weeks certainly days in order to try and figure out the answer where a piece of source data is coming from and that keeps them from making important decisions. On the other so, hand- so, so trust, so trust, so, tr uh, so consumers of data, right? The, the business analysts, whatever, need to be able to trust the data or identify if they can trust the data and lineage can help them that. So that's one use case in persona. So another use case persona is when we look in the opposite direction. You remember that we said, we talked about uh, understanding where data comes from, but also where does it go to? And the where does it go to has a couple of intersecting use cases. It's got a you know, very practical IT use case for the persona of those people supporting their applications, the DBAs, the developers, the programmers, the people that have to change a particular stored procedure. What are they gonna break downstream if they make this change? What's, what the impact is going to be if accidentally you know, they, they remove a column it happens to be critical for a report or data mart or some other calculation and it blows the whole thing up. Um, you know, by the same token, right? So we have a more IT specialist that's looking at that downstream concern. We're seeing folks that are getting into the data privacy world who they want to see the downstream because they want to know where the data is being peppered to. You know, people have been creating extract files all over the place forever. Well, if I can now trace that lineage, I can see more places where my exposure might be. And that is gonna be the risk compliance team. Yeah, I, I like both of those use cases as, as interesting contrast to people that are maybe a little bit more downstream already, sort of the people who are looking at just, you know, sort of the source of provenance of things. Um, because obviously in the risk situation, right? Like those, those security people, compliance people, they are having to deal with the increasing risks and threats around GDPR and CCPA and a lot of these different regulations. And, and a lot of times just simply scanning where something is right now is good, but a lot of times you find it, you deal with it, and then all of a sudden it appears again the next day, right? Because what's happening is you've got these jobs and these transformations that are repeatedly delivering data, you know, sometimes these sensitive data aspects to those locations. So it seems like lineage is really important there. And then in that sort of IT or DBA use case, you know, even uh, on my own team at data.world, right, um, um, uh, one of my teams that I work with very closely is our metrics team, and we're providing metrics to the rest of the organization. Um, and, uh, and, you know, we're always trying to make sure that, like, hey, when we modify a Python job or a SQL script or something like that, um, are we about to break one of our dashboards that we use to, to measure customer adoption and things like that, right? And so the, the, knowing those types of relationships ends up being really important. And, and sometimes, and sometimes things fill, fall through the cracks, and it does break. Now what? How do you find out? You know, one of your pie charts, you know, comes out, you know, completely one value or something, uh, completely skewed. Now you have to go back and figure it out. And it, you know, if something blows up completely, okay, it doesn't work anymore, and the portal doesn't come up. Yeah, you know, that those aren't so bad to debug. 
But if you have a subtle data problem and you need to go back and find the calculations and the way they changed, you've got to have that for root cause analysis, for sure. So, so, yeah. so we've talked about use cases and the personas. I, I'm, I'm always been curious about what can, what can actually be done today versus how much of that can actually be automated today, and how much of it is actually people expecting magic that we just really have to say the state of the art isn't there yet. Let's we still research or something like. Can you shed some light on that, Ernie? Well, I, yeah, I, I know that machine learning is one of those things, right? Where people are like, can I just throw some machine learning at it? And it'll tell me what's wrong, you know? Yeah, the, the, the lineage domain has uh, had lots of different solutions over time, but it came out of, uh, you know, impact analysis solutions in, in kind of code review and syntax review 20 plus years ago. And it kind of led into a more data lineage scenario, I think primarily for some of the use cases we've talked about that benefit decision makers. Uh, but the two have very much come together. And automating data lineage is not an easy task, but it is definitely one that vendors like ourselves here at Manta have addressed by taking near standard syntaxes, right? SQL being certainly a key one. And you know what? They're not all the same, but they're close, right? So you can look at Oracle and DB2 and Netiza and Microsoft SQL, and you can start to see patterns that you can lend to, that, to, to looking at that. And we break apart those trees. And there's automated solutions from ourselves and other vendors for ETL tools and for raw languages. Uh, we're releasing a COBOL one very soon. And because these things are structured and you think back to the long history of compilers, you can go through and trace this lineage and get near automation. Now it's never perfect because there are too many places where you have things that can't be scanned. Now, it could be a legacy technology. I've had customer uh, not too long ago ask me about Power Builder. I don't know how many people on the call here remember Power Builder. I have enough gray hairs to remember then. Um, and will there be a commercial solution for Power Builder? I don't know. I tend to doubt it. But there's got to be ways that you can push lineage in manually using either APIs or, or you know, common delimited files or other specifications to, to basically paint the lineage that you want. There's also one other aspect that comes into this all the time and it's sometimes that there is nothing to parse. I'll give you an example. Talk to a site where for whatever reason they haven't been able to shut it down. There's people that still do manual FTP scripts. Somebody goes yeah. up to a terminal and they type it in. So there's nothing to capture. Yeah, you know? I, I was, <laughs> that's so, interesting. I, I, I was, I was, we we're talking to one of our, our customers and also different prospects. It's like, so how do you get the data? It's like, uh, no, well, I go to this FTP site, I download these CSV files and then I manually load them. And like, so that's the provenance. So what are you, that's the lineage. Where does that actually, where can you go get that, capture that? So what we do in Manta is we let them define that in a CSV file. So they can define their own object, which is that file up on a mainframe somewhere. And they can have a little icon that's, that has a little note in it that says hand FTP, but it'll show up in the lineage picture. So once they define that once, they've got it covered. And, and so, you know, you need this combination of automation plus a small amount of, um, you want to call it manual, so, but so let's call what it is, assistive. What is, it, what, what, is this, what is the state when it comes to like, literally writing code scripts like java code or or python people will do a bunch of etls and transformations in python and script language like how much can we extract from that automatically and basically we're, we're can we actually reverse engineer programming language and, and get actual valuable information from that or is that still a, a no. hard problem great question we're making incredible progress with our java scanner uh, which has been available for a long time we're doing COBOL very soon we're looking at various ways of doing things like PySpark. But what we've also done is put in an, a, an assisted lineage functionality where the developer can put some annotations in yeah. that while they're editing the code, they can just tell Manta, hey, this, this column goes to that column. And frankly, you know, it can be adapted to any language at all. I've had people ask me about legacy languages like uh, Focus, you know, so um, where there's no commercial solution, there's these assisted potentials so that a developer, when they're looking yeah. at the code, can do it. That's something that I'm seeing. Like right now, uh, AWS is 
everybody's moving, right? Redshift or Snowflake, right? They're moving their warehouse to the cloud and then you have all these ETL solutions in the cloud and like AWS has this one glue. And it, like I've been playing around with it and, and yeah, you can do your ETLs and glue. And even if you're doing a simple transformation, like move the data from this column to this column, this one-to-one -one thing, which you would expect it to be like even an insert statement or whatever, that all gets compiled into Python. And then people go off and edited that. So now it's like all our transformations, all this really important logic, all this important knowledge that defines what profitability is, gets embedded and gets lost in more I mean, it's not even application code, it's a transformation logic code, right? That eventually it's only, not even business people understand it. Like this, this scares me. Well, I'm glad you, I'm glad you brought that up because uh, Amazon Glue, in fact, is one of the first ones that we've implemented this um, assisted scripting scenario. Um, we have some customers who are using Glue and they're kind of using it kind of as a launch mechanism. So they, they, yes, they're going to take advantage of its Python capabilities, but they're embedding SQL in it, for example. So we have yeah, the ability to, to express in an annotation where the developer can point us to the SQL, and then we'll put our SQL parser against that. Yeah. So, so they're getting contributions from our automated stuff at the same time that they're also putting their own expertise. Because um, there will often be some syntaxes or things that a developer used that that simply aren't parsable. So one of the one of my mantras that I say all the time, and you probably people have seen my talks, is don't boil the ocean. Don't boil the ocean. And I just feel that people want to go in and like, here's my data lineage crawler, whatever. Let's go put a crawl on everything and create this graph and go see everything. And somehow that's a solution to a problem. Like, and they end up boiling the ocean. Like, what's the process here? I mean, it feels like we should really be be agile about this right you can't just go say go go look at all the store procedures that i have i mean i, I don't think that's the right approach but i may be wrong here i don't know Tim, what do you guys have in your experience yeah i mean definitely on you know the cataloging side we we often tell our customers and prospects you know hey like if you're going to try to you know you've got 12 or 15 systems that you've got going on in your environment at least that you know of like uh, rather than say okay let's spend the next year and a half just integrating all of that and building our terms around all of that really taking a very use case driven approach right like what are the couple of sources you know uh, especially when you can go kind of end to end like that's always great right can you pick something that's a more of an upstream data source maybe your data warehouse is sort of the hub maybe a data lake um, you know, maybe an analysis source like Tableau or something like that, but like keep it focused and, and really be use case driven. Um, you know, I'm, I'm curious, uh, you know, Ernie, is that kind of something similar that y'all see on the Manta side is, you know, don't, don't boil the ocean, kind of start small and iterate. Absolutely. And I think that some of the use cases we've talked about and some ones that we haven't yet are significant there. So when we look at the compliance and, and, uh, you know, trust use cases, there is some group at every one of our organizations that's screaming the loudest, that has the greatest concern for their reports and their reliability. You know, start there. Start with those particular reports and go backwards into that particular system. Don't just start at the top alphabetically and try to capture everything that's in your enterprise. It's too much. Go with where you're going to get the biggest impact. Is that the team that's making decisions that have the biggest dollar impact? Well, then certainly that's a good place for you to start and increase their competence, have them making decisions faster and more reliably. We're also seeing use cases for migration. So I need to migrate to the cloud. I have an aging relational database management system from 20 years ago. I want to completely sunset it and move off to the cloud. My only option in my mind, because you know, people have left the team, we don't have a whole lot of people that really know how it works is going to be a, a big bang method, which means I have to transfer all 2000 tables, all, you know, 700 ETL processes and 200 reports. Are people using all those reports? Yeah. <laughs> you know, so if I can scope it, you know, start by interviewing the people who are using those reports today. And you might find out that there's 17 reports that they care about. Start with those. So you do the lineage yeah. on those. And now you find out that you've got 17 reports 87 ETL processes and 822 tables and the other thousand tables. Okay, we'll get there. Maybe we won't. Maybe we'll deprecate them completely, but let's start there because now 
we have an opportunity to get ROI from our cloud investment or whatever the modernization goal is without having to do a big bang theory and just not be able to get it done. Yeah, to, to, to this, I, I, I would say this is so aligned with all the conversations that we're having about, we gotta be, I mean, we gotta, the same way we do agile software development, we have to be agile in, in, in how we manage our data, but more specific, like we have to be agile in how we govern our data. This is exactly what, what we're talking about. Like, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Don't I, I build the ocean. That, yeah, this ties in really great to sort of broader data governance and data policy and things like that, because I think, you know, it's, uh, you know, lineage ends up being an important tool in a larger set of problems that you're trying to solve where, your, your, you know, data is growing like crazy and the number of systems and the complexity is growing like crazy. And so you're trying to pick a surface area that you can manage to kind of wrap your arms around. Uh, and it seems like things like lineage can really help you understand like what is being used, what is, what is, you know, what are the things that people are building off of and, uh, you know, and, uh, and, and where do we need to focus our efforts and, and, and really kind of, it can be sort of a, a big piece of that overall sort of governance tool set. So, yeah. because I, I, I feel that you have, I mean, even governance, and this is what you want lineage for this is, is you're, you're being very reactive or protective, right? I, I like, like this, I want, I want to protect what I have. I, I have all these risks, right? A GDPR, I need to have lineage for all these things. And I'm, but we really need to start flipping this around too. It's like, come on, we can't always just live in fear of something, right? You want to be able to kind of flip this around, think about it. Okay. How can this make, how can I enable this for, what is the, I mean, there's an opportunity cost here, right? And how am I going to go use lineage to be able to go do more, let's say the more positive things instead of avoid the negative things. Sure. And I think that's kind of a mindset that we, that, that we're starting to go see this, right? Because a lot of this governance and lineage falls in this place. It's kind of started based on the fear side. And I think people are like getting tired of it. It's like, it's not just fear. Like we, there, there's something positive around this. Yeah, I think that uh, where we're going to see advances in lineage are going to be in taking advantage of things like changes in lineage that are automatically discovered, where we can start to do alerts, you know, because Tim cares about a particular data quality factor or rule, and a new lineage uh, comes in the next day, and there's a change in that path. Let's notify him right away. Let's, uh, let's make sure that uh, if there was a change in a source that he's aware of it you know step one where so we can start to automate not just the collection of lineage but the action that you take on lineage can be automated as well yeah that, that i like that a lot that that's a key because i mean you can imagine that uh you don't want people to be hindered to go say oh i'm, I'm gonna go make this change and yes it's gonna go I, I gotta like they're afraid of the changes they're gonna go make, right? How about let me just go do that change, and if I know something's gonna break, let me know what is gonna break. Let me know who I should go talk to, and if the list is so long, how about you tell me who I should go talk to first, who's the most important person, and then we can go very quickly and just go iterate through this stuff and figure out what can be done, right? Because otherwise you're like, yeah, and, and we, we got, you got your. I mean, you're like doing going so softly because you don't want to like step on people's toes. Yeah, and, and worst case, you screw up, right? You, if you take a more proactive approach, where th then you're going to get an alert, right? Eh, something got messed up, right? And then you roll back, right? I, I think it's sort of that that agile moniker kind of applies to things like continuous integration in, in this context as well, right? Yeah. Tomas Kvaki, our CEO, loves to use an analogy of Google Maps, and you know, for a long time, Lineage has been a static map. Uh, go back 15 years or more ago, and I can remember printing out Google Maps and taking a piece of paper into the car, <laughs> right? No, no one MapQuest, does that. MapQuest, MapQuest. It was MapQuest. Yeah, or MapQuest, right? So now, of course, it's, it's an automatic alert, and I'll see things, especially if you're using tools like Waze or similar, and it's giving you alerts along the way. It's going to tell you where the nearest gas station is if you care. And, uh, you know, those are the kinds of things that we can start be able to get insights, insights from lineage that then complement the rest of the relationships that catalog tools like data lot world you know bring to the table so th there's a comment here from misty and i know there's been a chat that we've ignored apologies for that but uh, misty makes a great comment comment which is sometimes it's best to socialize a change in lineage before you implement it and i think that goes back to our uh, what we pr what we always talk about people processes and, and technology is hey i i found that this may break 
who's the owner of that data set, right? Let me go talk to that person. Then like lineage, I want to be able to connect not just the data, but also the people related to it. So I think that that's where I find the key. Um, hey, look at this quick conversation. That's already been 30 minutes. So um, let's kind of do a quick stop here. We'll stop the recording and, and we'll open the, open the mics up for everybody. So, Hey, thanks Ernie uh, for, for being a guest here and having thanks this conversation. Really Definitely. All right. Well, thanks everybody for being here. Thank you.